Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. And I'm really appreciative that you joined us today. We're super excited because we have with us Stan Gordon today. And if you haven't heard about him, I don't know what to tell you because he's all over the place. He has a long bio, of course, um, very notable one. He's an author of so many books, uh, director, producer of movies on television programs and so on. But Stan, thank you so much for being with us today. And if you could just give us a background as to who you are, some history about your past and why we're here today, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, Carolyn. Well, I'm, um, I got involved in this. I'm in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. I um, have been involved uh, researching, investigating UFOs, Bigfoot, cryptids, and various phenomena here in Pennsylvania, actually since 1959. I uh, started out as a 10-year-old child, was interested in science, electronics, and I just happened to hear a radio show talking about unusual occurrences. Uh, they were talking about everything from flying saucers, haunted houses, strange incidents, and I was a curious kid, and I wanted to know if these people were making the stories up or not, so I went to my local Greensburg library and began to read all the books they had on the subject. I was 16 years old in 1965 when the UFO incident happened near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, and I started investigating that case uh, uh, in the day or two right after it happened, and I've been out in the field ever since. And... Um, in 1969, I'm, I'm giving you the very short part of what I've been involved in. I mm -hmm. set up a hotline for the public to report UFO sightings. I began to make contact with the local media and the police departments in the area. And that phone never, never stops ringing. It is constant reports coming in very often. Between that and email reports, I receive many reports on a regular basis all year round. Uh, 1970, I found the first of three volunteer research groups to investigate these incidents that for many years would investigate all these phenomena across the state of Pennsylvania for years and years. First group was founded in 1970, the Westmore County UFO Study Group. It was kind of a unique group in that those involved were mainly specialists. We had scientists, engineers, technicians, uh, police officers, former military specialists, all, all kind of just amazing people with backgrounds who uh, did this voluntarily. We all did this around our full-time jobs. And by 1973, I was set up that we could investigate and cover the whole state of Pennsylvania. And so for many, many years, we did that. Uh, I don't have my groups anymore as such, but I'm in contact with many other researchers and groups um, who are out there actively investigating these cases. And uh, so it, it's been amazing. I've investigated thousands of UFO sightings and hundreds of Bigfoot and cryptid sightings. Reports come in every year, a lot of activity. Last year, uh, this year, it's just amazing what we're finding out. And um, we're learn we've learned a lot about these various mysteries, but I don't think anybody for sure has the answer to what we're dealing with. The more I know about it, the stranger it is. I agree. I agree. So let's talk about, um, you know, some of your books. I know you've written how many of them, Stan? Several of them, at least, right? I've written four books. Um, the first book was called uh, Really Mysterious Pennsylvania, and that deals with just a lot of amazing cases where people were physically very close to low-level UFO sightings, uh, these strange spheres of light, spherical objects very close to the ground, very near them, which have been increasing more and more in recent years. Um, a lot of strange creature reports, Bigfoot encounters. The second book uh, is called Solid Invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot Casebook, which is still very popular. People from actually around the world still call me about that because that dealt with the, the biggest, first the biggest UFO outbreak in history anywhere in the country here in Pennsylvania in 1973. There were hundreds and hundreds of UFO sightings coming in all year long. So you've got to remember 1973, because I'm sure we'll talk more about this as we go on. There was no cell phone, no Internet like today. So the public didn't know what was going on. But many of the local and statewide newspapers were picking up many of these reports. So we're busy with my team just out there investigating all these UFO sightings, many of which were low-level, large structured objects below the ground. But then in the summer of 73, we had the biggest Bigfoot outbreak ever documented, which continued on until 1974. And we've had Bigfoot sightings recorded every year since then, including this year. 
And um, it's just amazing. And that's when we found that there was a lot of very, very strange incidents showing up. And I'm sure we'll get into some of that. That's when we began to realize that Bigfoot was much stranger than just an unknown species, an unknown uh, type of animal or creature. It was something much more unusual. And there was some correlation between UFO and Bigfoot sightings going on. So we can get yes. into that. So that solid invasion book goes in great detail. The third book is Astonishing Encounters, which, again, covers all these other cases of all these very strange creature Bigfoot sightings. And the, the most recent book is called Creepy Cryptids and Strange UFO Encounters of Pennsylvania. And it goes into very detail about a lot of the very strange patterns I found, correlation between not only just the UFOs, the balls of light, Bigfoot, but also other cryptid reports and the similarities. And the more I know about it, I'm telling you, it's more and more indication we're dealing with something that's interconnected with various types of phenomena. And so that's Creepy Cryptid and Strange UFO Encounters of Pennsylvania. And the books are all available on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Now I'll make sure I put the links to that um, and to your website as well, which is StanGordon.info.com or slash WP. No, it, it's www.stangordon.info, I-N-F-O, stangordon.info. Oh, okay. Okay, because maybe I'm not on your homepage. Uh, yeah, okay, I see that now. Yeah, I'll have all the links in the description of this video as well. So what is it that you said you were drawn to this at an early age of 10? Um, you know, and all these decades later, what exactly do you do other than write books and make documentaries and whatnot? Uh, and just well, I, I've only produced one documentary, and, and that was on the Kecksburg UFO incident. I right. won a uh, film award for it because that was an amazing story. I mean, we could talk for days about that case, whatever it may have been. Um, but I worked in the electronics field all my life, and I worked full time, had a family, and was for years I ran two different volunteer research groups at the same time. Wow. And um, well, I'm retired now. I've been doing it for a long, long time. But uh, now I babysit grandkids and uh, investigate UFOs and do a lot of other interesting things. And what do you do with the data other than write books? Um, do you give this data to the governments? Um, what exactly do you do with it? I, I'm i in touch with many, many researchers around the country. Um, and so we can compare the data. And I, and I put a lot of the important cases out of my website so people can learn from it because there's a lot of things out there going on the public's not aware of. I mean, first of all, let me say from the time I've been out in the field since 1965, what I learned when I first started and the same today, for many UFO sightings that the government now calls a UAP, unidentified anomalous phenomena, many of them seem strange and unusual initially, but when you take the time to investigate the reports, many are determined to be either natural or man-made in origin. So a lot of the sightings that come in that look strange, but there's an explanation. For example, last few years, a lot of Starlink satellite reports, drone reports, various type of balloons that are launched, reentry of space debris, meteors, meteorological phenomena. There's a lot of things that look strange, but they can be explained. However, every year, some amazing incidents are going on every year, right through the last few weeks, that you could not easily dismiss. And, and I investigated multitudes of very low-level, detailed UFO incidents over the years, uh, all kind of very close-range Bigfoot sightings, many in, in the last couple of years in daylight. We're seeing more and more reports, I can tell you, in the last couple of years of both UFOs and cryptids that are occurring in daylight at, at quite close range. So that's what's so interesting, the details and the quality of the reports coming in. Wow. Now, you also investigate um, cryptids and, you know, other strange entities, like you mentioned, Bigfoot. Uh, where's the correlation? I know you mentioned, and I've been hearing a lot about that, that there's some type of, like, multidimensional aspect to possibly the connection between UFOs and, and these cryptids. So could you kind of explain your perspective on that? Yeah, and it'll take a little while. There's a lot of detail. We could talk for, for hours and hours. But anyhow, so it was back in 1972 when I first noticed some odd things were showing up. In 1972, uh, actually only several miles from where I live, out, it was a rural area, a large wooded area, and I was getting independent calls from different landowners out there who had lived there for years 
but they began hearing these screams and howls, something heavy bipedal walking in the woods. People saw this large, uh, wide-shouldered creature chasing dogs. They were finding strange footprints around their properties. They were seeing UFOs around there and these little spheres of light very close to their homes. And like, what in the heck is going on here? I've never seen so many oddities, and why is it going on now for weeks and weeks in, these, in this certain area? So I'm documenting all this information, and then 1973 comes around, as I had mentioned. Started day one of, of January of 1973, continued the whole year long, multitudes of UFO reports coming in from all, a lot here in southwest PA, but from all across the state. And again, a lot of these were detailed, low-level reports. Uh, a lot of these you would find in, if you find in the news, if you go in my Sound Invasion book, you'll see a reference to many, many newspaper accounts from that time period. So we're out there with my teams investigating all these UFO reports. And then the summer of 73, where there's this massive outbreak of Bigfoot activity, that was just so, so amazing. Many of the Bigfoot sightings were in daylight, many at quite close range, sometimes more than one creature seen together. Not uncommon, we would get on the scene sometimes within minutes, hours after they occurred. And that's what, luckily, I had my group set up by then. And uh, we are actually very surprised in 1973 that as all these incidents are, incidents are occurring, we're receiving ref, uh, referrals from not only the news media, from law enforcement across the state. And uh, so we were so busy just trying to keep up all these re reports. But here's the thing. You know, I started investigating Bigfoot sightings in Pennsylvania in the 60s. At that point, I was completely convinced that Bigfoot was some type of unknown primate for what I knew about Bigfoot. And there had been a history of Bigfoot sightings in Pennsylvania going back to Native Americans and even for the newspaper accounts from the 1800s. They talked about sightings of these huge hair-covered creatures in the woods. But they didn't call it Bigfoot back in those days. It was basically uh, the wild man of the forest, the wild man of the of the woods. And um, so anyhow, we're investigating all these incidents. And so this is all year, year round, including winter and snow. So we would get on the scene sometimes within minutes after a Bigfoot sighting. There'd be trails of these large, unusual footprints with big strides between them that mm -hmm. would go for a distance and then abruptly just stop when there should have been more tracks. Well, that was one of the first things that showed up was very, very unusual. And by the way, that's going on now all over the country for years, the same thing like that. Right. Uh, so anyhow, we're investigating all these sightings. So once again, people had no way of knowing what their neighbors were reporting, what was being reported 20, 30, 50, 100 miles away either. And all these reports are coming in, and there's consistency, there's patterns developing, there are people extremely reluctant to even tell us about some of the weird things they were experiencing, but just to give you an idea, so one area um, here in Greensburg where a number of incidents happened in daylight as well as in the, at nighttime where people were very close uh, to these things and odd things were going on, the animals were going crazy. Um, anyhow, there, would be, there was one area where during daylight people in different locations would report that they see this huge hairy creature in daylight let's say 40 or 50 feet away, just standing there, that suddenly would vanish and moments later would reappear, maybe would reappear maybe 10, 20 feet away at another location. But we weren't hearing those reports just in one spot. We were hearing reports over the months from other widespread locations as well. And then we began to see a pattern. We'd have a UFO sighting in a particular area. Within minutes to hours or days later, we'd have a Bigfoot sighting or vice versa. So when you hear me talk about some of these things, I am not suggesting, from what we now know, that we're dealing with a, a creature, a Bigfoot, that's riding around in a spacecraft from another planet. Because we don't know for sure what these objects are, where they originate from. And that we can get into great detail about that as well. But that, so I'm not saying they're extraterrestrials when I'm trying to state, because we don't know for sure what we're dealing with. I don't think anybody really has the answers a lot of what we're dealing with. So anyhow, you had these incidents with Bigfoot and UFOs going on for months and months. And I can go into great detail about some of the amazing cases that are going on. But one of the cases kind of sticks out, because we'll get into it, was the incident that occurred in September of 73, north of Pittsburgh. That evening had two... Uh, Two uh, young women waiting for a friend to pick them up to go somewhere. It's a wooded area. They see the seven, eight foot tall, huge Bigfoot with white hair running across the road towards the woods. 
but in one of his hands is carrying a small glowing ball of light. And a short time later, this object came across the sky, and it projected this brilliant beam of light down into the woods where the creature ran into. So we're thinking, what in the heck is all this going on? As the weeks and months went on, the reports got stranger and stranger. And do you want me to go into some detail about some of those cases? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, but well, this is going to take a little while because they're, they're okay. detailed reports. So the, one of the most famous cases, and by the way, this whole report, which we don't have time to get into, we could spend hours talking about one case alone. But this entire case is, goes into great detail in my Solid Invasion book because there's this is probably one of the weirdest, not the weirdest case ever documented anywhere in the world. It's been written up all over the world. And I remember it very well. It was October 25th, 1973. There were numerous UFO reports coming into my hotline from across the state during that 24-hour period. But it was about 10.30 that night. My phone rings. I get a call from a state police officer from the Uniontown State Police Barracks in Fayette County. And by the way, Fayette County has been historically and continues to be probably one of the most active areas in the country for ongoing anomalous encounters from UFOs of Bigfoot the Cryptid, especially along the areas along the Chestnut Ridge. So that mountain range extends through Westmoreland, Fayette, and Indiana County, and southwest Pennsylvania, and extends a few miles outside of Morgantown, West Virginia. There are sightings all along there, but there are certain particular areas where the phenomena, for whatever reason, seems to focus on, and that's very, very intriguing. That's what I've been finding for years, that you can have encounters anywhere, but there are certain specific locations or properties where the phenomena seems to be very, very active for years and years. And there's places like this ongoing right now in Pennsylvania. So that's uh, very intriguing. So getting back to the story. So I get a call from the state trooper for the Uniontown Barracks. He had just came back from investigating this multiple witness UFO landing on this farm in Fayette County. And I found out about 9 o'clock that night, he had 15 witnesses they're outside. They observe this huge, maybe 100 foot in diameter, this huge barn sized red sphere, about 100 feet off the ground, hovering, but beginning to slowly move downward. And um, so I, I always focus the story on the, the farmer's son who was coming out to visit his family. So he'd be the adult in this group we'll be talking about. And he's riding down the farm road to go to the farmhouse, and he sees these people standing outside watching this thing, which he sees. So he goes to a, a better location, get a better view, and there were two young uh, boys in that family, and they're all watching this thing coming down, three of them, and it looks like it's going to land. So they thought, we want to go and see what this thing is. So before heading up towards the pasture, they go over to his dad's farm, and he obtains a thirty odd six high-powered uh, rifle and a handful of ammunition. He didn't realize it at the time. He had two tracer bullets in the ammunition with the regular am ammunition. So when you fire the, those tracer bullets, just get that luminous trail. So anyhow, they're riding down the farm road. The dogs around the area are going crazy. They had this high-pitched whining noise and these baby crying sounds. As they're getting closer and closer to the pasture, the sounds are getting louder. So they finally make their way towards the pasture. They park their vehicle. And again, I'm giving the short part of the story. There's a lot more details we could tell you about. But anyhow, they, they're walking up the hill towards the pasture, and they finally get to that location. When they get up to the area, they're standing there in amazement. About 250 feet away, that huge object has now landed on the ground or right above it. But it's no longer a complete sphere. It's like a big white dome, like a half a sphere. So anyhow, they're watching this thing. It's making this loud whining noise, illuminating the whole area. And they're just trying to figure out what the heck is this thing. Well, as they're watching this thing, their attention's drawn. There's a barbed wire fence about 75 feet away. It was along that barbed wire fence, they see these two huge hair-covered Bigfoot-like creatures walking one behind the other very stiffly, kind of stooped over in their direction. The one in front's about eight feet tall. The one behind it's about seven feet tall. They're, um, they have very long, dark, matted hair hanging off the body. They have no neck. Uh, the arms are so long they're hanging below the knees almost to the ground as they're walking. They make, they're they making this loud baby crying whining noise, and they have large, luminous, green glowing eyes. 
The one kid is so frightened he ran out of the field. So the other boy yells at the adult, shoot him, shoot him. The guy takes his first shot. He fires over their head, didn't realize at the time it was a tracer bullet. Well, there was no response at that point. He fires that second tracer. When he fires that second tracer, the largest of the two creatures reaches out as if they grab that tracer and makes a loud whining, crying baby noise. And that huge glowing object vanishes. It doesn't take off and accelerate. It just disappears. So at that point, most of the luminosity and the sound is gone. The creatures turn around slowly and start walking back along the fence line towards the woods. At that point, the guy's loading his 30 6 with live ammo. He's firing into him directly, and there's no response, no indication they were being hurt in any way. So they run back to their truck. They go back to the farmhouse. They told the family what happened. They took him to a neighbor's, and they called the state police. Troop arrives 45 minutes later. And um, anyhow, the witness said, look, just forget about it. You're going to think I'm crazy. And the truth said, look, we had a report of two similar creatures up in the mountain the night before. I have to take a report. I have to investigate it. So they went up in the troop car, and they're looking for evidence where the object was on the ground. And the trooper told me when they arrived on the scene, the area where the object was, had been on the ground was self-luminescent glowing, about 100 feet or more in diameter. He said he noticed one that the farm animals wouldn't go anywhere near it. He said he had a flashlight aimed his a flashlight beam into it, but he could barely see it. He said he was certain if he had a newspaper, he could have crouched down in that glowing area and read the newspaper from from the light coming off the glow. Wow! There, that's when it gets much stranger and stranger. I'm, I was told they went back to the barracks a short time later. Both the trooper and the witness were taken to two separate rooms. They were separately interviewed. Then they called me to send up my team. And by the time we got there, it's already almost early morning, and we spent the whole night up there. And what happened during the night continued to be one of the strangest stories on record. I don't have time to get into it, but I can tell you there is no doubt in my mind it was real. There was a big investigation going on. A famous psychiatrist at the time who was very interested in these things, Dr. Berthold Schwartz, uh, came and spent a week up here investigating the whole incident, went, went away convinced everybody was telling the truth. Uh, that's when we began to realize we're dealing with something as much stranger than an unknown animal. But in the weeks ahead, things got even stranger. So if you want now, I'll tell you about the case that convinced me that Bigfoot is something other than a normal flesh and blood animal. Yes, please. Okay, so so this now goes um, in the February of, of 74. So it's February 6, 1974. And I'm sure some of your listeners will remember this time period. There was a big national trucker strike going on. There was gas rationing across the country. So everybody remembers the gas rationing. Absolutely. There was, viol there was violence across the highways, across the country. In Pennsylvania, both the National Guard and the state police were patrolling together during that time. You had some members of both teams that responded to this incident. I couldn't get gas early the next morning to get up to the scene with my team. Anyhow... What I learned was, so here's this woman who lived, lives, lived very deep in the mountain in this little cabin home, lived in the woods all her life, knows animals very well, was a very good shot, pretty much not afraid of anything, and it was a normal evening. She's sitting there watching television. She hears this noise on her little front porch. She had some empty pop cans out there, and someone was knocking the pop cans around. Well, she had told me, I think it was two or three weeks before, she had a pack of wild dogs came through. So she thought in her head, I bet those dogs are back. So she thought, you know what? I'll grab my 16-gauge double-barrel shotgun, and I'll just shoot over their head and scare those dogs away. So she proceeds to load one chamber of her shotgun. She walks up to the front door, hits the switch for the outside porch light. She opens the door and steps out. But there's no dogs there. Six feet away from her is a seven-foot-tall, huge, gray-haired Bigfoot that put his arm straight up over its head when, when the light went on. How did she respond? She pulls the trigger. She said there's this bright flash of light, like the strobe on the camera, and that huge, hairy creature vanishes right in front of her. Wow. But that's not the end of the story. So her, her in-laws lived 100 feet away. They heard the gunshot. They called her, asked what she's shooting at. She explained what happened. Her son-in-law grabs his sidearm, starts walking down that dark road, and apparently at some point he was surrounded by four or five hairy people with eyes like coals of fire. 
and it was soon around that same time that a large luminous object, like a big tri- Christmas ornament, was hovering over the trees at the same time. That's when they called the state police for help. And um, so later, I, like I said, I couldn't get up to the scene the next morning. Uh, when we got up there, everything was back to normal. But I, I interviewed the primary police officer, and he said, by the time they got on scene and found the place, everything was over. But he said, witnesses were extremely credible. They are visibly very shaken, very shook up, gave great detail about what they saw. But what, what convinced the trooper was that the animal reactions on, on the farm. They had different type of animals, several big dogs, other animals. They were all acting very odd. The big dogs, and which, by the way, I've, I, I think I told you originally, I may not have mentioned this or on the air, and all the years that I've been doing this now, going on 65 years, I've never personally seen a Bigfoot or a UFO. Right. I've seen a lot of evidence out in the woods. I think I even chased a Bigfoot in the dark in 73 through a, a cornfield, but I couldn't catch up to it. Um, but anyhow, I have seen, in many cases, I've seen very large dogs, even in recent years, that were in very close range to these huge Bigfoot creatures. And no matter what species they were or how aggressive they were, they were just like paralyzed in fear. They wouldn't bark. They shaped. They cowered. Sometimes they would lie down and you could see their eyes move around, but they wouldn't make a sound. Sometimes they wouldn't eat right for days later. Very, very common. And that's what he saw when he got to the farm. The dogs wouldn't make a sound. They wouldn't bark. Now, when I got there early the next morning, they were all barking. Everything was back to normal. That was the case, among others, that convinced me, and we're dealing with something that has a physical and a non-physical aspect to it. For lack of a better term, I'll call it interdimensional. And there's a lot more we found out about this now since that time, a lot in more recent years. I started writing about this back in the 70s. So I think some people will recognize some of what I'm telling you is similar to the skinwalker activity. Right. But I was dealing with these cases in the early 70s, long before we knew about skinwalker activity. And now these things are going on all over the country and around the world. It's crazy. Um, what do you think, and I'm sure you've been asked this question many times, why do you think in today's world with the advent of everyone has a cell phone and video access, why can't we get a clear video? Everything always seems to be, like every time I see Bigfoot or Yeti videos or, or pictures, they're always like lurking somewhere in the back and it's grainy and there's really not any good documented video or photographic evidence. What do you think accounts for that? Are they swift and like just vanish before anybody gets a chance to, to grab good video? Okay. Well, it's a little complex question, but I can give you some answers to that or give, give you some possibilities. One, you know, in a lot of these cases, especially with Bigfoot and cryptids, the incidents occur sometimes within only seconds. They walk out in front of a car. People see them walking through the woods. And I'll tell you, I, I interview people all the time. And so many of the witnesses I interview are so credible. You'll be amazed at the background of the people who call me over the years, you know, from educators and engineers and uh, hunters and police officers, first responders, all kind of credible people. Many of them never believed any of these reports. They used to laugh at these stories, make fun of people till they had their own experience. And let me tell you, I deal with these people all the time. And for many of them, it's, it's been a life-changing experience. A lot of them still, I'm in touch with some of these people from 20, 30, 40 years ago. And still, lives have been changed by what happened to them. And there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. So anyhow, in a lot of cases, it's, it's a matter of it only lasts a few seconds. There's not always time to grab a camera or two. People are so shocked, even when they have good cameras before we had digital cameras with them or have a digital camera or a phone, they're so shocked they didn't even think about taking a picture afterwards. Sure. However, there's this other aspect to it. And I can tell you this one, yes, I do get pictures in quite often. I get pictures in even the last couple of days. So I get many cell phone pictures in. I get, I get security camera f- uh, p- footage in. I get game cam footage in. Some of it is very, very interesting. Uh, if you go to my website, you'll see some very interesting pictures taken in the last couple of years. Uh, even this year, many of these are what the government calls the Tic Tac reports. I've been receiving these reports for years and years going back to uh, – 
probably probably late 60s, at least early 70s. So these are these long, cylindrical, somewhat cigar-shaped objects that are wingless. Uh, in the last few years, there have been more and more reports of these things in daylight, in the, all around here in western Pennsylvania, other areas in daylight, just hovering in beautiful skies and afternoons. And many witnesses say they're watching this thing, and suddenly it just vanishes. It doesn't accelerate and leave. They just vanish. Or in some cases, they fade away. In some other reports like this, they move extremely slow across the sky. And, yes, we have some videos of that. Um, but in some cases, they change. Uh, they just physically vanish and are gone. So, yes, there are some pictures of these things. But it gets much stranger. Um, there have been in the last, last year, 2023, we had a very big increase in very detailed, low level, close range UFO encounters in Pennsylvania. So these involve not only the reports to the, these cylindrical wingless objects, but also large, solid, black, silent triangular objects. And again, not just what's happened the last couple of years, but even over past years, we've had incidents where People have let me give you let me give you an example. Okay, so this is on you know, my memory of state 2015. This is up in the mountains near Donegal, PA. So kind of on the border of Westmore and Fayette County. Again, active area for phenomena. So this fellow uh, on this particular morning it was a beautiful morning. He's sitting in his kitchen next to the window drinking coffee. His big dog's lying on the rug. All of a sudden, it got jet blackout like a terrible storm just instantly came out of nowhere. You think, what the heck's going on here? He grabs his fully charged cell phone. He calls his dog to go with him. The dog would not go out. The dog goes with him everywhere. The dog refused to go with him. So when he walks out, he grabs his fully charged phone. He walks out to his backyard and his driveway. 500 feet above him is a huge, solid black triangular object that's hovering over him. What's he do? He grabs his fully charged phone, hits the record button, and seconds later, his, his fully charged battery is completely drained of energy. That has been going on more and more in recent years. So we have numerous reports of people who have attempted, even last year, to take videos or still pictures of these objects that were very close overhead. In some cases, they hit the report record button. They're seeing the image on their phones, but when they play it back, it's not there or only maybe a, 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 a brief, maybe a still picture is not real clear. That's been going on more and more. And the other thing that's really, really intriguing, and I think this is a very big part of the, of the whole phenomenon we're dealing with, and a lot of people don't talk much about it. You're beginning to hear more about it on some of the TV shows now and some of the podcasts, because I've been talking a lot about it too. I've called these, these objects mini UFOs for years. I was aware of this since the 1960s of these kind of cases. They are definitely increasing. 2022, we had the biggest increase in reports of these small, generally spherical objects, but not always. So these things are intriguing because they're not high in the sky. They are very low to the ground. And in some cases, in daylight, coming up within a few feet of people. Mm. They're amazing reports. And, um, and so this is really intriguing. Uh, so, of course, some people refer to them as orbs of light, which orbs some is just spherical or balls of light below the ground. We're not talking now about ball lightning. These, you know, I, I'm aware of that that's a very rare weather phenomenon. The cases I'm talking about, we had no weather conditions like that. The conditions and the occurrences were completely different. And if you like, I'll go into some detail about those. Sure. All right. So just, and again, there there are so many different cases and some of it is very very weird uh, over over the years well let me tell you this what i found out is one this, this the smallest size ones are about the size of a large oversized fire firefly or lightning bug mm -hmm. but most of them are around the size of a golf ball to a baseball to about a foot or two in diameter and there's some variations there too generally spherical sometimes they look completely solid other times they look more like a bubble or they're transparent there have been some reports where some type of a mass moving around the side of them. Um, I've had reports for, for years of these things in daylight, pacing vehicles across Pennsylvania, entering, entering people's homes and cars through open windows, sometimes now appearing inside of people's homes, 
going right to the walls of the house, right to the walls of the vehicle. I've had them um, actually kind of just, uh, I don't want to say banging, but kind of knocking on the windows, living room windows of people's homes, and when they see them, they fly off. Um, we've had them come up very close to people. So October of 2022, up in Fayette County, one of my research associates, Jim Brown, investigated this case. Six o'clock in the morning, it was very cold, and this man was just in his, uh, I believe it was robe and slippers, his wife found him sound asleep on the porch outside, which she would never, ever do. She had a heck of a time waking him up, I was told. When he, when he awakened, he told her he was walking out to get the newspaper just been delivered, and here was a small sphere of ball of light right at the head level. And as he got close to it, it was within a few feet of it. He got so tired he couldn't stay awake, and he fell asleep on the porch. Three days later, I saw a Ligonier PA which is a very active area. So you have the Chestnut Ridge, and then soon after you have the Laurel Ridge, which is also very active too. And this occurred um, that day, uh, three days later, 2.30 in the morning, this woman awakes, awakens in her home to go to the restroom. She comes out of her restroom and five feet away in her living room, which has an older house, high ceilings, here's this, I believe about foot and a half, two foot diameter, dark blue sphere hovering right there in the living room. She can see like a dark mass moving around the side of it. She told me, she said, I remember taking one step close to it. I felt like a slight electrical shock. And she said, all of a sudden, I got so tired, I couldn't stay awake and went into bed and fell asleep. And she said, the next day, I felt very weak, very sickly. And she said, this makes no sense. I'm an insomniac. I don't fall asleep like that. So you had two similar physiological effects reported within days of each other. And that's just a sample of what's going on. But it gets weirder and weirder with the reports coming in. Uh, there was another case uh, up in Fayette County. I believe it was a year before. I'm, I'm so confused now. I have so many cases in the last few years. But anyhow, it wasn't long uh, around the time period uh, in daylight that um, two people were outside that afternoon, beautiful afternoon, out, out in their yard digging, uh, planting some whatever they were planting, they noticed this bright, shiny object, um, not that far away, I think it was about 50 feet away, about 10 feet off the ground, slowly gliding towards them in the afternoon. They thought it was a Mylar balloon at first. Mm-hmm. It's about two feet in diameter, it's bright, shiny, silver. As they get closer and closer, it gets brighter and brighter, and they realize it's not a balloon at all. And I don't have a report right in front of me, but as I recall, as it got very close to them, it was like a little snap, and it like a sound, almost like a firecracker went off. And this, there was like a fl- electrical jolt that went from the object to the ground that moments later set that s- small area on fire in the field that they immediately put out, and that object vanished. So Jim, my research said, he got on the scene within 45 minutes. Had this been a firecracker or been a mylar balloon that had exploded, did be residue all over the place. There was absolutely nothing on the scene there to explain it all away. Uh, there was another case a number of years before and I'm just giving you a random reports. A fellow's riding down the road out in the country one afternoon, and here's this solid, small ball of light on the ground blocking his passage. So he knew, he thought it was very strange, he'd have to get up and go over and move this thing so he could get home. He opens his car door, takes a few steps towards it, and the thing begins to fade away, vanish, and disappear. <laughs> and then, just to give you another example, and this just is in... October of last year, so right around the end of October, four o'clock in the afternoon, inside of an apartment building in an apartment, two people sitting there on the couch watching TV. Three to four feet away, suddenly, this about three-inch diameter round sphere, like a a little uh, kind of a golden color, made no sound, just suddenly appeared. It's flooding around in the living room. It moves up to about four feet high in the living room and just hovering. Then suddenly, about 10 similar objects that may have separated from the main object suddenly appears. They have all these little spheres of light fluttering around about a six-foot area in the living room. This went on for about one to two minutes. Two people were startled. They didn't have a phone. They didn't have a cell phone or a phone or anything to take a picture with. And um, suddenly, those those little ones, they all vanished. But the main object was there. It fluttered, moved back behind the television, and disappeared, and they never saw it again. That's just the kind of things that are going on that the public never hears about. Right. It sounds similar to, like, um, 
orbs like for when you're watching like a haunting investigation, you know, you hear so much about like people seeing these orbs. Do you think there's a connection between like the spiritual aspect of this and UFO sightings? I mean, are any of these things tied together, do you think, or or are they separate? No, I, I think some things might be. you got to look at each case individually, but mm -hmm. there are some similarities. For example, and I know I, I'm all always been interested in hauntings. That's not my thing. I deal mainly with cryptids and UFO cases. But interestingly, over the years when I first started this, I began to realize sometimes you have these other paranormal events being reported on the property. So mm -hmm. you can't just eliminate these things. People talk about apparitions and ghostly events and paranormal stuff going on with some of these locations where some of these other phenomena are occurring as well. And uh, I, I can tell you Years and oh, many years ago, I was invited to speak uh, down in Eastern PA, outside of Gettysburg, not too far from there, I believe it was. Many, it's maybe been twenty years or more ago. I can't remember at this point. And anyhow, I did not know this, but they had gotten permission. Some of the other speakers were really they were ghost hunters, and they were pretty good ones. Mm -hmm. And they they all had those big old heavy duty shoulder mounted camcorders. Well, I didn't bring any equipment with me because I didn't know we were going. So anyhow, they got permission to go in this private so alleged haunted house. And that's when some of the little more advanced uh, camcorders came out with the, with the night vision and the side viewers on. And some of these people had uh, pretty good sensors for uh, cold spots or whatever. And they were seeing these little orbs in some of the, si in some of the viewers. I was watching them myself moving around. And I'm watching with people. I think there were six other people I had camcorders with them. I'm moving around. This was so interesting. Within a few minutes, all six of the camcorders, all the batteries lost power. They were all drained yeah. power. Yeah, you hear so about that's, that. Yeah. So that's similar to what's going on with people who are trying to take photos and videos of the orbs of light below the ground with some really sophisticated night vision equipment. Everything was fully checked out, ready to go. You're hearing this more from all across the country, but here's the other pattern. For years in Pennsylvania, and now going on around the country, we have some reports in locations and areas, we have a history of Bigfoot sightings. Many researchers or witnesses are seeing these small orbs, balls of light, low the trees are coming low the ground and coming up very, very close to these witnesses. That's been going on even in recent months, I'm, I've been told. And we have an area out here that... Um, the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society and some of the other researchers have been investigating. They uncovered, I believe, in the last couple of years while investigating Bigfoot activity. It is another hotbed for ongoing phenomena, from cryptids to UFOs to Bigfoot activity to weird screams, the orbs of light commonly being seen. Uh, so you'll hear, I'm sure, be hearing more and more about this place over the over time. Oh, yeah. um, what, it's, it's what, th what do you think these orbs of light are? Since they're being associated with all these different cryptids and UFOs, what do you think, that, in your own opinion, that they are? Well, when I first knew about these back in the 60s, I didn't know the origin. We still don't know for sure what they are. Now, the more I know about it, I think the stranger they are. Because, again, these things are being reported everywhere. The Skinwalker Ranch is reporting yes. that activity. Many other locations across the country reporting it. And it gets stranger and stranger. Um like I said, when I first knew about these in the 60s, I thought that these were some type of device that were sending back audio and video information to some source, whether it was man-made or something else, we didn't know. But now the more I know about these orbs of light, there, there are reports coming in, some of them I'm even reluctant to talk about. But, you know, I know you've talked to Simeon about these. Yes, he's, had some, he's heard these reports. There's other investigators I've talked from all over the country. They're getting similar reports. There are people who, and I've interviewed people myself, who, who say that what they're dealing with is so bizarre, even with the Bigfoot phenomenon, there's so many aspects that people don't know about, that, again, there seems to be a physical and a non-physical component to it. And when these balls of light, people swear, they've seen these balls of light change into other life forms, other creatures. Yes. People swear they've seen creatures change other creatures. I talked to experienced hunters who have fallen strange footprints that change into other tracks as they're going along that trail the tracks change to a different track. Um, I'm telling you, this is so complicated. I don't think yes. anybody, including the government, is aware of it. 
I think we're dealing with something, again, for lack of a better term, I'll call it interdimensional. And it, even with so many of the UFO reports, you've got solid-looking objects that suddenly change from one form to another. They suddenly appear and disappear. We're dealing with something that has similar traits to it, but it's so strange and so bizarre, and I think a lot of these things are somehow interconnected. Yeah. I recently had a call about um, a lot of folks think that these entities are either angelic or demonic. Do you delve into that realm, or do you think that they're neither, that they are truly extraterrestrial and that has nothing to do with angels or devils? I, first of all, what? I'm not, again, I am not suggesting what we're dealing with is extraterrestrial. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm saying we're dealing with something I don't think. I, I said years and years ago, I think with some of the UFO reports, we're dealing with more than one origin to the unknown category of the UFO mystery. So maybe a small percentage of some of these UFO reports could be extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. But I think more and more what we're dealing with has a physical and a non-physical component to it. Some of the objects, the cryptos, the Bigfoot stuff. There are. I have many reports, and again, it's not just what I've investigated. There are many other researchers I'm in touch with around Pennsylvania and around the country and even out of the country for years who have gotten similar reports. And a lot of them are reluctant to talk about it, but now I can tell you the last five, six, seven years, maybe more, more and more people in the Bigfoot field aren't laughing at these cases anymore because they're seeing these spheres of light low the ground. Can, there's some correlation with the Bigfoot stuff. Uh, but in, in a lot of Bigfoot cases, I've talked to people in daylight who are riding down the road and suddenly the seven, eight foot tall huge creature suddenly appears in the middle of the road. They should have seen it coming. It suddenly appears in front of them. They see it from head to toe and it suddenly vanishes. Right. In other cases, some people say the creatures look completely physically solid. But in other cases, these things appear, part of the body looks solid. Some appears out of focus or you can see through it. Some appear to be more misty or hazy looking. I have reports of these things not only running, but kind of gliding or floating above the ground. Um, I'm telling you, it, these are so many credible people, and it's other cryptids as well. So I'm not dealing with just Bigfoot and UFO cases, and right, I should say big other. I deal with the Thunderbird reports, which we've had a number of these sightings in recent weeks in daylight, a low level of these huge flying creatures been reported for years. I deal with uh, floating, uh, gliding entities. We have this winged humanoid creature that's been nicknamed the, the Butler Gargoyle in Pennsylvania, something somewhat like a, a Mothman type report, but we've had those in Pennsylvania for years. I My new book, Creepy Cryptids, is full of things you've never even heard of before that are so bizarre. Weird things in the water and the lakes and rivers of Pennsylvania um, that's been reported for years. Stan, what and, about the Jersey Devil? I'm sure you've delved into that and done some research. Um, what do you think of that whole myth and cryptid phenomenon? Well, I, you know, I've talked to people over the years. And I've read a lot of reports. So I'm in the other part of Pennsylvania. I'm down near Pittsburgh, and that's more towards your left, towards New Jersey. <laughs> and I'm aware of the reports. And I and it seems like there's more than one thing, more than one type of cryptid possibly involved in, in the stories over the years. You know, from Bigfoot sightings or something huge flying creatures. And again, we've had similar accounts down here in Pennsylvania for years and years and other neighboring states as well. So a lot of places reporting similar type of things. But, you know, another mystery that I find fascinating, and I'll tell you an account about it, are the out-of-place reports of Black Panthers in Pennsylvania. And there's a correlation with this, too. Um, so one, we talk about Black Panthers. Now, we're not talking about, not talking about mountain lions or cougars. That's another story. We're talking about black leopards or black jaguars, which right. are animals not common to this part of the country. Right. But they've been seen for years and years, including in the last couple of years here in Pennsylvania in daylight. One hunter reporter went a close range, and he said to me, he said, you would never convince me it was real until I saw it myself. And I hear about that from witnesses and all these various type of anomalies being reported. But anyhow, so sometimes when you have an outbreak of ongoing phenomena from UFOs, the balls of light, weird things going on in a certain area, more than one cryptid will be reported. And over the years, sometimes there are Black Panther reports, which have happened around here going back to at least 1970, no, 1979, I would say. And, but it's the same thing. 
There's very few so-called Black Panthers in the zoos around this area. There's, um, if, there's, if there's ever been a report we check, it's rare for these animals to escape. So right. that's not the case. Something's missing, okay? But let me, let me give you a really interesting case I investigated back years ago. February 1983, I believe it was, way up in the mountains of Pennsylvania. It's a cold morning. This guy's got coming home. His car's overheating. He pulls into his driveway and uh, goes inside to get the can of antifreeze. So he comes back out. He's putting antifreeze in his vehicle. A few minutes later, here's this loud growl behind him. And about 20 feet away, here's this large black house cat sitting there growling at him. Well, he didn't get very excited over it because where he lives in the car. There's cats all over the place. So he goes back to putting more antifreeze in the car. A couple of minutes later, he hears this ladder growl. He turns around to look. He said, couldn't believe it. That big house cat has now physically grown twice its size. It's staring at me. It's growling at me. And he said, I threw the antifreeze can, can at it. It started walking outside, outside, which is all lit. It's all illuminated outside. And anyhow, he said, I ran to my house to get my pistol. He said, I come out a few minutes later. He said, I couldn't believe what I'm seeing. So now that big house cat is outside towards the road, well lit. Now he said it looks like an animal I saw in the zoo, like a, a big, full black panther with wow. a long black tail swishing around and glowing, luminous yellow eyes growling at me. He said, I took a shot at it. I don't know if I hit it. But moments later, as I watch it, it physically vanished right in front of my eyes and was gone. Do you think that was like a skinwalker thing where they can transmute into different types of animals and entities? Well, that's, again, you know, that's similar to what I've been finding since the 70s around here. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things that go on, and I'm not the only one. There's other researchers, again, not just in Pennsylvania, but around the country, that these things are occurring as well. But, you know, I, a lot of them talk to me privately. We've shared these things. We've exchanged information. But these kind of things are going on now all over around the country, and other very good research are heard from Europe and other parts of the world. Similar reports are coming in. So whatever we're dealing with is very widespread. It's beginning to come out slowly, but there's, there's, it, it's so strange and so bizarre. You know, how do you deal with it? Nobody right. understands. I'm sure the government is very much aware of it too. And I, and you know, I always thought it was very, very interesting. You know, they they changed when the government started their their new UFO uh, office. So it's an identify. Um, so it's uh, all domain anomaly resolution office, and they changed the terminology from UFO to unidentified aerial phenomena to unidentified anomalous phenomena. And I thought that was very intriguing because I, I truly believe that whatever we're dealing with. It's not just one thing. It's involved with other type of phenomena we're dealing with. Yeah, that makes the most sense. Why do you think the government is going out of its way to suppress and bury all this information? Their last report um, came out and basically denied the existence of these anomalous entities. Like, what's your take well, on it? It's, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on it. I've been following uh, what's going on. And... Um, Anyhow, at least they've opened the door that, you know, you've got NASA out there. You've got all the government agencies involved in this now. There's been congressional interest in these things. There's some people in Congress trying to get more and more information out. My understanding is, you know, while you did hear about that report that came out, there's other things that have been going on since then. There's other legislation that is active right now. And from my understanding is I believe it is, I think, that all the government agencies – have to submit to the National Archives all their records of anything could pertain to UFO sightings, UAP sightings, whether it is classified or unclassified. And it's going to be in late October, I believe, that all the information has to be in and digitized and determine. They will determine at that point what information they can release to the public and what will remain classified. That's my understanding of it. So anyhow, they're, they're trying to get more information out. Uh, personally, I don't think anytime soon there's going to be any major uh, disclosure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that this is going to go on for quite a while because I think the government's in a position where they know these things are happening. They're not in control of it. And I think they're realizing whatever we're dealing with is so strange. Nobody has the answers. 
And right now it's just not the situation where they can come out to the public and really talk about it because they don't know what we're dealing with either. Right, right. Well, that makes that makes the most sense. So before we uh, say goodbye, tell us what your uh, plans are, what you're currently working on, what you're projecting that you're going to be working on. What do you have in the works? Well, I'm dealing with cases all the time. I mean, quite often, I mean, we're for reports in the last few days coming in from areas. We're trying to check on some of those. But reports come in all the time. It never stops. Plus, old reports come in. People report things all the time that they experienced in past weeks, months, or years. They never reported. And so that's going on. Uh, I'm, I'm doing many speaking events. I've been pretty much booked all year to do many events around here. We have a lot of big events coming up. We have the... Uh, Kecksburg UFO Festival coming up July 19th to 21st here in Kecksburg, PA, and thousands of people come in from all over the country. Uh, if you go to my website, there's some really good, we have the Pennsylvania Bigfoot uh, Camping Adventure coming up in September. We have another new event in the Chestnut Ridge coming up in August. Uh, if you go to my, under my website, under upcoming events, I keep putting them on, so there's some really interesting events going to be occurring this year, some new ones. Um, there's, uh, I'm going to be at, well, I can't even think of all the ones that are booked this year, but I have a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of interesting things in the works, I could just tell you. And I think in, in time, you'll be hearing about some of these things. So uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in what's going on, I can tell you that. Yeah, I've been showing your website to the folks. And again, I'll put all the links so that people can, of course, visit your site and uh, possibly go to some of these events too. I'm sure they're, they're a lot of fun and very interesting. Well, Stan, thank you so very much. This has been absolutely intriguing to me. And um, I'd like to stay in touch with you and possibly check back in and see what's happening down the road. Oh, that's fine, that's great. And uh, I understand where you're from. And yes, I get reports from across the state and there have been reports for years um, all through the area up northern Pennsylvania, up around the New York PA border. It's going on everywhere. I mean, I don't think there's yeah. an area around Pennsylvania that there haven't been reports of something going on. Gosh, I, area- I haven't seen one yet, and, and I'm in eastern PA, so I keep going out there and looking up and hoping someday to see something. That's it. Well, there are, there is activity in your area, so keep your eyes open. Well, thank you so much, Stan. And, of course, I will be in touch with you. And um, if anybody has any questions please feel free to leave them in the comments below. And I'm sure Stan will pop back in and be able to answer some of them. Thank you so much, Stan. God bless, and I'll be in touch soon. Okay, thanks very much. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you.